Thank you for listening to this PYA webinar recast. PYA is pleased to offer this alternative way to access our thought leadership. This is a recording of a previously delivered webinar. The information is accurate as of the date of the original event. The video recording, slides, and associated material for this and all PYA webinars are available on our website at pyapc.com. This podcast is for educational purposes only. It is not intended to be used as legal advice or an official opinion. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of PYA's Healthcare Regulatory Roundup webinar series. Today's topic is Deeper Dive, 2024 Medicare Physician Fee Schedule. PYA is happy to present today's webinar on this important topic. With that, I'd like to introduce our presenters, PYA principals, Angie Caldwell, Lori Foley, and Valerie Rock. Thank you, Shannon. Appreciate everyone joining us today in regards to this Medicare Physician Fee Schedule proposed rule update. We want to make sure that we give you even more of a deeper dive into this content. Um, as you might have listened to our last episode, um, we covered from a high level a bit of what was going on, but we're going to take a deeper dive today. And Lori and Angie and I uh, appreciate you joining us and, and happy to um, you know, give you a little bit more of this content so you're ready for 2024, and really some of this is ready for 2025. So we'll talk you through um, that as we go through. But again, it's Lori Foley. Uh, my name is Valerie Rock and Angie Caldwell uh, joining today to speak with you in regards to this content. So we're going to jump right in. Um, we have a lot to cover, uh, including the conversion factor changes to that. Um, the Office and Outpatient e &M, uh, Complexity Add-on Code that you may have heard of. Um, there's a lot to discuss there. Split shared visits, um, you know, that's been kind of the buzz lately. So we want to talk through really how to think about this and, and what to plan for going forward. The telehealth update, we're continuing to make transitions um, with that area. Remote patient monitoring. Um, diabetes prevention program, shared savings program, and the quality uh, payment program. So again, a lot to cover, but we're uh, going to dive in now and, and let you um, make sure you're aware of what you need to know going into 2024. So we'll start with the conversion factor. Um, we are looking at a potential negative adjustment of 3.36 percent to the physician fee schedule, similar to the anesthesia fee schedule, um, if everything that is proposed actually goes through. Um, we've seen a continued shift uh, in negative adjustments because of the impact of the 2021 fee schedule changes that were relevant to the e &M services. Um, when those e &M services change for the office and other outpatient services and the valuations of those codes changed, and then we continued to make those changes in 2023 for the remainder of the codes, we were making such shifts financially that we have budget neutrality adjustments um, applied. However, we were also in the middle of COVID, so that you know, impacted Congress um, to say, okay, well, we're going to kind of kick this can down the road a bit and allow those adjustments to happen later. So last year and this year, we're seeing more significant adjustments down. Um, however, you know, we'll continue to see this fight towards uh, really adjusting this upward because there's in no way um, a less expensive, uh, you know, valuation for healthcare um, at this point. So reducing our payments um, as we go forward is not going to be sustainable. Um, so as we work through inflation and workforce shortages, we anticipate Congress is going to act and they already have a bill on the floor on um, this HR 2474 that is anticipated to align itself with the Medicare Economic Index. Um, to the extent that that can occur and, and make it more simple and have an upward adjustment each year, then that's the hope. But there's also concern that the cost of this will be too significant um, for Congress to actually pass this. So Angie, tell me a little bit about the physician compensation impact related to this. Thanks, Valerie. And as Valerie suggested, my role in today's discussion is to really, as we're getting into this deeper dive, 
surrounding the proposed rule is really to bring a, a side of the, the angle of this related to physician compensation and how the proposed rule may impact folks um, on from that lens. The conversion factor, as Valerie said, continues to decline. So one of the things that is important to remember about this is that work RVU changes are universal while the conversion factor change from a reimbursement perspective is Medicare specific. So it, it's important to think through how then that impacts you from a physician compensation perspective, whether you pay your providers on a work RVU basis or perhaps a collections basis, or you're looking and considering collections as a factor for determining uh, the proper evaluation uh, for your physicians, but it's important to, to separate those two. Regardless, the reimbursement decline from Medicare continues to put significant pressure on practices where there aren't offsetting work RVU increases to keep the collections amount um, the same. So it's really important, and this is why it's hard to get your, our hands around exactly what the impact will be, other than that we know that there will be an impact. It takes some very detailed analysis to understand what the impact will be between the changing of the work RVUs in addition to the changing of the conversion factor. From an anesthesia perspective, my goodness, anesthesia has just taken, just been bludgeoned over the past couple of years from a, from a reimbursement perspective as it relates to Medicare. And then also coupled with the uh, No Surprises Act changes. Um, Anesthesia practices will continue to struggle, perhaps operationally, where there is a large uh, Medicare payer mix for that practice. They may continue to seek additional financial assistance or, in some extreme cases, seek to become employed um, by, by someone else or hospitals where that's, that's possible and, and allowed in the particular state or jurisdiction. Valerie? So now we're going to walk through the office and other outpatient e and visit complexity add-on code. That code is the G2211, and it is for the complexity of services that are provided generally by primary care providers, but it doesn't have to be primary care providers that are serving patients from a longitudinal perspective, that they're overseeing their care for a single serious condition or complex condition, and those services that are above and beyond the E&M service where they, they, they may interact with the patient either through telehealth or in an in-office visit, um, that this care is, is above and beyond that. So the value of that is intended to be paid for under this G code. Um, the complexity of this add-on code though is that it's not clearly defined. And I think as people actually apply this code and add it on to their e &M services, and the e &M services will only be for your office visits um, that you'll add this on to. But if you add it on to your e &M visit and inappropriate to the way that CMS is seeing it, then that's a risk to your practice. So again, it's a, a G code that's added on in addition to your e &M service for your office only services then this is for Medicare only at this point. Um, so it's for that ongoing care that is, is longitudinal and um, that is intended to address those, that single condition. What we'll see though is that, let's see, fans that, sorry. Um, that the Consolidation Appropriations Act um, in 2021 put a morat moratorium on this code in 2021 um, until 2024. About 90% of the budget neutrality adjustment that's occurring for this year is related to this code only because it's such a significant impact. Um, originally, the CMS thought that it was going to be applied to 90% of the E&M services, office-based services, that would equate to $3.3 billion worth of revenue. Um, and so because of that, and because of shift, you know, we saw budget neutrality potentially impacting um, during COVID, and that's why it was stayed at that point and, and pushed to 2024. Now they've revised the possibility of the utilization of this code to 38% of the office-based codes. 
um, with the eventual application of them at 54%. So once they're fully adopted, they anticipate 54%, but that still means that there's still confusion about when these codes will actually be um, utilized, which also means that there's compliance risk. So really look out for how, how your MACs are communicating, how to, how to apply these codes, and don't just apply them to all of your services because that will um, you know, be a certain risk for your, um, for your practice. Uh, what we're already seeing, though, is these G codes are being applied to non-face-to-face -face services like psychotherapy codes within their valuation. So when when we have or the non um, E and M services, so psychotherapy that does not include E and M is um, being valued to include this code, and there's going to be an uh, implementation over the next four years because of such a significant increase in those codes. So we would anticipate to see that. In the future as well. These codes will just be utilized for Medicare um, with new or established office visits and um, when the E&M with psychotherapy is billed together you can utilize this service um, and then again when the providers take a responsibility for ongoing subsequent medical care for the patient that is longitudinal um, in nature. So when you think of this, it might be that a certain number, certain types of diagnoses that would be considered something that you'd be managing over time and, and that you'd have a higher need for interaction. Um, I'm thinking of uh, this kind of the basis of chronic care management and things like that as well. So we've got layer on, upon layers. We're seeing Medicare trying to pay for the services that are done outside of your typical e &M service. So you would not bill this to any of your other payers, but watch for them to apply this code. It's not likely that they're going to throw money at you. So um, I don't anticipate this being utilized by any other payer, but watch for that to be um, potentially changed um, as we go. Though Medicare Advantage um, will likely be required to um, cover this because it is a covered service under Medicare. Um, so we anticipate that that would be pulled over into that side. Um, it will not be allowed to be used with a 25 modifier as proposed. Um, this would be an area where you might want to comment because if you're an oncologist and you're doing an infusion and you have a 25 modifier on your e &M service, that doesn't necessarily negate the fact that you're having a lot of other care outside of that e &M service. So I think that there's a lot of reason for them to also include or the allowance of this G code in addition. Um, to the 25 modifier used on the same day. Um, again, certain specialties um, and when the provider does not have an ongoing relationship with the um, patient, then it would not be appropriate to use this code. And so, <laughs> if we look at the other side of the coin from a physician compensation perspective, uh, the, this particular G code has been assigned 0.33 work RVUs, and Medicare is anticipating high usage of, of this particular G code. So let's just walk through that a minute um, from the lens of physician compensation. So we're anticipating work RVUs to increase because of this. Again, work RVU valuation is universal, while the reimbursement related to it may not be. Um, is only related to Medicare and, as Valerie said, certain, certain MA plans uh, may follow the rules well. And so if you think about that, then compensation is increasing without potentially 100% of a reimbursement offset for that compensation or a relative sized um, increase in, in compensation or collections. So we need to understand how this code is going to impact the compensation of, of our providers. And this, this includes um, not only physicians, but to the extent that APPs are involved in this code, um, you know, that, that remains um, to be seen, but we would need to think through that through and how this is impacting all of that. 
So the individual impact, of course, is going to vary based upon individual facts and circumstances, okay? So if, depending upon, again, how much your provider is, is doing in this space, and also the relative payer mix um, for traditional Medicare uh, for the payer. So again, we're talking about work RVU-based compensation. If your provider is not being paid on a work RVU-based model, um, then compensation uh, may not be impacted. Your measurement of physician productivity behind the scenes, maybe not in your calculation of physician compensation, will still be impacted. And so you'll need to think through that. One of the things that we've been monitoring um, from a PYA perspective is that, you know, many organizations are still using prior year fee schedules to determine work RVU values for physician compensation. Many organizations are beginning to catch up. They caught up quite a bit in 2023 and used 2023 as the year to catch up. For those organizations that have not caught up, we just urge you when you're thinking about if 2024 is your year to catch up from a fee schedule perspective, we urge you to consider the impact of this code um, because it is not is not present until now. So in, in 2024, you need to think about how this is going to, to impact your work RVUs and in your providers. Okay, ma'am. All right, so now we're going to shift to split shared visits. And I'm gonna start by giving you kind of an overview of what this is. So what is a split shared visit? Make sure we're all on the same page. So a split shared visit is an E&M visit performed by a physician and a non-physician practitioner or NPP. Using that term as opposed to what Angie said with the APP, it's a synony synonymous, but NPP is what's actually in the fee schedule and in the, ma in the manual. So I wanna make sure that you know what to look for when you're um, researching this. Um, but these e &M services pr provided by both providers is in a facility setting only. So split shared is facility setting only, does not apply to the non-facility setting, but it's on the same calendar date. So two providers, same date of service, e &M, e &M visit. Um, since 2022, uh, the critical care services have permitted, been permitted to be billed as split shared service, um, and they have applied the um, what we'll talk about here in a minute, the time-based only uh, provision for those services uh, as of 2022. So if you have not caught up with the critical care changes, you'll want to look at the manual, the CMS manual related to those services and make sure you're applying those correctly. <clears throat> the um, combined service must be billed under one provider if the, in the same pr group practice. And then if the NPP bills, of course, they're they're um, reimbursed 85% of the fee schedule as opposed to the 100% that would be reimbursed if the physician bills. So this is where the potential impact from a revenue perspective comes into play. As of May 2021, um, the CMS removed the split shared guidelines from the Medicare Claims Processing Manual because of a petition um, uh, related to a rule that is no longer um, in place anymore, but they were able to remove it because the 2021 guideline changes included definitions about split shared that conflicted with the CMS manual. So then they said, okay, well, we need to remove this so that we're not confusing everyone. But then it was a matter of, okay, now what are we going to do? So in 2022, um, we finalized the ability to either bill based on time, which is to say that either the physician or the NPP is providing 50% or more of the um, service time. And if they are, then they would be the billing provider as opposed to, or in addition to the option of either history exam or medical decision-making being used as if one of the providers, um, you know, documents a complete history exam or medical decision-making, then they can use that level of service associated with that as the um, billing code. So as long as they're meeting that billing code related to that one of those three key components, then you can bill under the physician if they meet it or the NPP if they meet it. Um, and you have those options. So we had either time or key components um, from 2022 to present. Um, prior to 2021, though, we had 
you could do a face-to-face -face visit with the patient um, by the physician and either one of three key components um, had to be some portion of that had to be documented not the complete component but some portion of it had to be documented so um, this is this these new rules are definitely a shift um, an increased requirement so in 2022 the final rule um, was actually put in place into the manual in January 1, effective January 1 of 2023. So we have a final rule that says that you have these two options in 2022 to bill for the billing provider, but it's not actually in the manual and effective until January 20, 2023. I say that because if you are audited in the future related to these services, all of this time period, and all of these requirements and what was effective when matters to your defense. Um, so you'll want to make sure that you're capturing all of these dates to make sure you know what was effective at each point in time. So during um, the last final rule, you know, we were um, we pushed the can down the road again to say, OK, well, as of 2024, we're going to require time only. Well, as um, of the release of this proposed rule, um, we're looking to postpone that to 2025. So we'll have still have the option, and based on the current definition of the substantive portion of the visit being defined as um, that which would be billing the um, be the billing provider, of one of three key components: either history, exam, or medical decision making or more than half the time spent by the physician or NPP identifying that billing provider. I want to say also that you know the way you select the code would be based on the entirety of the visit for both providers, but the one provider that provides that substantive portion and, and it meets the definition of substantive portion would then be able to bill um, for that service. Generally, what we're looking for is the physician to meet that criteria so that you are actually able to bill at 100% versus 85%. So that's really where the rub is, or what, whether it's under the physician or the NPP. <clears throat> the AMA is currently looking at revising the definition of split shared to address this issue. So if, if that is released prior to this final rule, then CMS may go ahead and make revisions to this year's rule to allow um, to align the definition. So say CPT comes out and says, here's the definition, CMS agrees with it. They may just follow that rule and say, we're going to finalize the agreement of um, following CPT. So watch for that. Um, we'll be looking out for that final rule to state one or the other. <clears throat> So again, we're extended to 2025 um, to allow for these two differences um, or two options for billing. Um, so now the, the rule is defined as years 2022 through 2024 allow you these two options. Um, note that again, critical care is uh, finalized and in the 2023 final rule, actually stated that 104 minutes have to be met in order to meet the 99292 um, and because there were some issues with the definitions within the manual so that's all been updated as well so make sure you have noted that so then how do you document these services and how do you make sure that these services are supported within the record um, you want to make sure that um, the physician and NPP who perform the visit are actually documenting that they're um, included, both included in the service. Um, the individual who performs the substantive portion um, has to sign and date the medical record. And then um, for the split shared visits, one of the practitioners has to have a face-to-face -face visit, but does not have to be, doesn't have to be the billing provider. So you can have a billing provider that does not actually see the patient, which is a you know definitely a departure from the old rules. So it's good to know that, though I'll caveat this, that you'll wanna look at your MAC requirements because the MACs are a little bit all over the place um, for their implementation of, the, of this rule. <clears throat> um, so the substantive portion can be entirely with or without direct patient contact and is determined by the portion of total time whether time the, the time involves patient contact or not. You'll apply the FS modifier um, to any of the services that are billed 
as split shared. So whether you're billing it out under the NPP or the physician, you'll use this FS modifier. It'll notify uh, CMS that it was a split shared visit. What I wanna dive into this um, further into is the Medicare Claims Processing Manual and the requirements under E&M um, because there's a, a conflict in what is being asked of us versus what, um, you know, what we can actually do. So if we look at the Medicare Claims Processing Manual in Chapter 12, we see that either the history or the physical exam um, can be used as a substance, substantive portion when the practitioner who bills um, that performs the component in its entirety. Now, if you look then to the E&M guidelines, the requirement for history and examination is a medically appropriate history or physical exam. So there's no requirements for history of present illness and review of systems and past family social history and eight elements of a you know, body system review and things like that that we used to have. Those elements are no longer applicable. So the 95 and 97 guidelines have been sunset. We are now within these new guidelines. After 2023, we have a new set of guidelines all together for all services. So for these facility visits, we're supposed to do a medically appropriate history and physical exam. And that is determined by the treating provider. So the definition of a medically appropriate exam is determined by the treating provider. The extent of the history and physical exam is not an element of selection of the E&M service. So when we look then at the expectations of the Medicare physician fee schedule in 2023, it says, given the proposed delay of the substantive portion of the policy, our current policy remains in place. An e &M visit requires a medically appropriate history or physical exam in accordance with its code descriptor and qualifies as will qualify as a substantive portion. So you're allowed to do this medically appropriate physical and history and physical, but there is no level of service that you're actually supporting. So how do you determine that you're doing complete for the level of service that you're trying to bill, which was the intent that you will see in the original um, you know, final rule that this was um, stipulated in. So that that is the complexity of um, applying this. So when we look at the history and exam, we're talking about subjective elements for supporting a code versus medical decision making and time being objective. So the least risky scenario for either one of these is using medical decision making as your support for your documentation for a complete medical decision making by that physician and then being able to bill it. Now here's the problem, is a complete medical decision making as of 2023 is supporting the code in its entirety. So you no longer need the, the split shared visit if, you're, if your physician is having to support the service in its entirety under medical decision making in order to support split shared. So, it, it's a conundrum, right? So now we have time as an option, but we know NPPs or APPs are the ones providing majority of the time with the patient. So we anticipate the shift over to the APP or NPP in this billing when, as time becomes the only element. So then really what we have here is a shift to the billing at 85% versus 100%. So in effect, we have a 15% reduction on these services, even though they're provided by two providers, the quality is still at a physician level, and effectively the value is, is going down, which doesn't make sense. And, and a 15% shift in the value of a service should require some ki kind of actual comment period. So we wanna recommend that you comment on these and make sure that you're showing your changes that are occurring within your practice if this shifts only to time so that CMS can understand the issues that are related to this shift. So in regards to um, continued valuation changes um, in relation to E&M, there's a, a big shift um, for what 
is intended to be valued for e &M services. So CMS is continuing to request information regarding this. So uh, take a look at these um, questions when you have a chance to, so that you can respond and comment regarding these questions. But Angie, your thoughts on split shared visits and um, how that's going to impact compensation. So Valerie, your discussion really demonstrated how complex this issue is from a regulatory perspective. And that regulatory complexity really bleeds over into the physician compensation impact. And so thinking about this, um, we really have three areas of focus and for the audience's consideration related to thinking through the physician compensation impact. First, number one, expect changes in attribution of work RVUs between providers, between your physicians and APPs, and try to anticipate that as best as you can based upon the regulations as they, as they are, and know that to the extent those providers are paid on a work RVU basis, then their compensation will be impacted and affected accordingly. So two, along with this change, we also have the movement of the work RVU values then relative to the applicable CPT codes. Those are also changing at the same time. That increases the complexity because we have both the work RVU attribution change as well as the individual work RVU to CPT code changes that are occurring each and every year. So that may compound the effect. Third, please remember that benchmark survey data, which we know and love and rely upon, um, will be delayed as it relates to this. And the benchmark data will take a while to catch up when the, when the rule comes in, in, into place. Benchmark data will delay and you won't be able to tell when you're looking at the benchmark data um, how this has been implemented, how it's been impacted uh, for the individual providers. And so you just need to understand that the, that the survey data will be directional and not necessarily the, the end-all be-all as it relates to determining the compensation for the providers uh, who are significantly affected um, by, this, by this rule. And so one of the things to keep in mind, and I, and I said this before and I'll say it again, the work RVU changes are universal. The reimbursement changes are Medicare specific. And so when you think about this from a valuation perspective, a physician compensation valuation perspective, the compensation to collections ratios are going to be, they're, they're going to become skewed and have some noise within them in addition to uh, the work RVU data that, that we are seeing. So this, of course, this change will have a greater impact for hospital-based specialties. I, when I think about this rule, I think of our hospitalist providers and hospitalists that work with APPs and the significant shift uh, between work RVU attribution that could occur there. But we're talking about other provider types as well. Um, and so just just be prepared and be on the, the front end of, of analyzing this and how it's going to flow through your physician compensation plans. And Angie, I think it's, it seems like this is becoming norm, right? Because we ha we've had big changes over the last couple of years. They still predict or propose big changes. Those changes get delayed. So we've had it for the last several years. It looks like we're going to have it for the next couple of years that this just may be the new norm and, and that variability will exist for the for the foreseeable future. I couldn't agree more. And with that, it's causing a lot of organizations to to question what used to be a very reliable measurement for physician compensation in the work RVU is now quite volatile. And so there are, there are questions about which specialties does it make the most sense to have on a, on a work RVU based model with some specialties, perhaps hospitalists, perhaps being one of them, critical care being another, uh, you know, those specialties, does it make sense to continue paying them on a work RVU based compensation model? 
Now, work RVs are not going to go away. In fact, in a, in a webinar that we did just a, a few weeks ago, um, we heard from our attendees that nearly 70% of the attendees at the webinar said that they continue to use work RVUs as a component of their compensation structures for at least the next three years. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think they're going away, but work RVs, that is. I don't think work RVs are going away, but perhaps the importance of them within the compensation construct will begin to, to lessen as the rules continue to change and be more complex. And as one physician said to me, you know, the cheese keeps moving um, mm -hmm. as it relates to, to the work RVs and the, and the work RV values. Yeah. yeah. But I think, you know, analyzing this and as we've seen, analysis of this is very physician specific. So uh, analyze this across your providers and communicate to CMS during the comment period to make sure they know what this impact is going to be to you um, because a reduction in revenue, regardless of the compensation model is still an issue. And these, these are some of the, <clears throat> I mean, these relate to $20 billion of revenue. So 15% of 20 billion is a lot. <laughs> so what they need to know that that's, you know, that's a big shift that they're not, I don't think they're really accounting for in their valuation. Yes. So we'll move to the telehealth um, update as well. So as we have moved from telehealth in COVID and, you know, we had pre-COVID and then we have COVID telehealth, we're shifting now into what is telehealth going to look like in the future? And so CMS is navigating that and trying to do that as slowly as possible to ensure the safety of the patient and the quality of the service. So all of these shifts, changes, or pushing out of dates is re relevant to that. So what we'll talk about is first aligning with the Consolidation Appropri Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023. Um, well, they're still going to allow through 2024 the waiver of the geographic and location requirements, which means that you can still see a patient at home um, and it doesn't have to be a rural area. So you're still, still allowing those waivers of flexibility. <clears throat> They're delaying the in-person requirement for telebehavioral health services, meaning um, that that six month visit that was that is intended to be in-person does not have to be done uh, via in-person scenario. It can be done via telehealth through 2024. Um, the FQHC and RHC reimbursement that was designed during the PHE, uh, that methodology will still be applied in 2024. Then the expanded list of telehealth practitioners will remain through 2024, and they've added, <clears throat> excuse me, marriage and family therapists and mental health counselors um, for this year. And then the coverage of audio-only services that are on the telehealth list will continue to be paid um, as, as they are listed there um, for 2024. One thing that they have changed though, is they're looking to how do we actually request information from everyone regarding what should be telehealth services and how do we make sure that they're going to be safe and the quality that we expect. So instead of having three categories of service now, they're going to have permanent and provisional categories so they can accept these applications and say, yes, this meets our you know, definition of telehealth and it has enough efficacy and enough, um, you know, reviews and studies to support that this is safe for the patient. So we're going to include it in the permanent list or there's still studies to be done, but it kind of meets that criteria. So we're going to put it in the provisional list. So that that is going to be just, you know, a bifurcated list instead of this um, three three different um, lists here. So what you'll see is that the list has been shifted over into this provisional category as they figure out and navigate what this is going to be. Part of the problem is that as we meet this cliff in 2025 um, that says, okay, now we have to you know, come back off of those geographic and location requirements, um, then would this telehealth service even be applicable or allowed 
um, at that point. And that is one of the reasons why they're hesitating for allowing some of those services. So um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll watch as that uh, continues to be navigated. Um, one of the things that is changing for 2024, so this is a 2024 change, is that we're no longer going to use the concept of using a 95 modifier with a place of service based on when the patient would, where they would have been seen, um, if not for the PHE. So now we're going to say, okay, the patient is at home, so we're going to use place of service 10 or the, play, the patient is in another place of service, even with their office, hospital, SNF setting, now we're going to use place of service 02. So you no longer use that 95 modifier, you use either the, the 02 or the 10, and the 10 would be only used when the patient is actually at home. It will be paid for the place of service 10 will be paid on the non-facility fee schedule, and the place service O2 will be paid on facility. For, so for anything that is actually done in the office, meaning the patient is in a, an office setting or another facility setting, then that um, payment will be reduced. But for all your home-based services where the patient is at home, then you'll get paid for that non-facility level. They're suspending the frequency limitations for the inpatient nursing facility and critical care consultations um, because they're trying to determine if those uh, limitations actually are applicable or necessary at this point. So through 2024, they'll suspend them. Um, they actually had at the end of the PHE um, a requirement to reapply them, but they said they're going to enforce their um, uh, discretionary and uh, independence so that they don't have to actually enforce that. Um, so at this point, you don't have to follow any frequency limitations, but watch for that for 2025. Um, we're gonna continue to permit teaching uh, physicians to have virtual presence um, instead of in-person presence so they can perform that kind of supervision and that those key components for via telehealth through 2024. Um, and then there's a permanent deletion of the in-person requirement for the injection training. Um, so that is a permanent change uh, because they realize that, that that's not needed. So they're making that change. And then they're continuing to permit the opioid treatment programs to furnish periodic assessments via telehealth. And then you see a slight uptick um, for the Q3014 to be paid. Next slide. Then the institutional staff um, will continue to be paid in 2024 for outpatient therapy services. Uh, so whereas that shift happened during COVID, that will continue to be allowed during 2024 as well. Next slide. Direct supervision has been a hot topic. Um, we're waiting to see how this is really going to be molded and taken into effect um, as we move forward into 2025, but as of right now, we're postponed again through 2024, and we're allowed to use uh, virtual uh, direct supervision for the services that you've been providing um, generally in that method during COVID. Uh, so, you know, keep, keep doing that, but watch for those shifts and changes and what is finalized um, in the final rule, because you'll wanna see, are, does it look like they're going to shift completely back? But the context is really, let's look and see which services should be allowed to do this and which should not. So include your comments um, during the comment period regarding these services um, that may be um, applicable or appropriate to do under virtual um, direct supervision because services like infusion services that are done typically by a clinical staff those are the types of services that we're watching for. Are they going to require direct supervision for these types of services or not? Next slide. So making sure that you're documenting um, the history exam and medical decision making as you normally would for an EM in in-person visit when you're performing a telehealth visit, um, and including the statement that shows the platform that is used. 
um, where the provider and patient are located and the roles of any other participants. This is important to document so that we can see what, you know, was this really a telehealth visit? Was it not? You know, was it audiovisual? Was it telephone only? That type of thing that that supports the code that you're actually billing. And then in, in, in 2024, we'll show the place of service that you're billing for. So making sure that you're capturing all the way through that is important. Next slide. So I'll shift it over to Lori for room at patient monitoring. Perfect. Thanks, Valerie. We'll see some continuation of some of that um, discussion related to uh, the telehealth component as we look in the remote patient monitoring. Let's see. There we go. Um, so when we look at it in, from a big picture perspective, there wasn't a ton of stuff that was new related to remote patient monitoring and therapeutic, uh, excuse me, remote physiologic monitoring. Still get tongue, you know, you go back to that first uh, when we first got the RPM code, but it is the remote physiologic monitoring and then the remote therapeutic monitoring. But they did expand these codes or are proposing to expand these codes to rural health clinics and federally qualified health clinics under code GO511. And that includes the monthly monitoring and the treatment services. So prior to this, uh, FQHCs and RHCs had been excluded from using these particular codes. There is still some um, proposed discussion relating revising the supervision related to Medicare enrolled physical therapists and occupational therapists, particularly for services provided by PTAs and OTAs under their general supervision. And Medicare is asking for comment on whether that general supervision should extend to all services and not just RPM. So that will be relevant to a lot of uh, clinician types that are providing those PTOT services and using some of the um, supervision of the PTA and OTAs in particular. It did clarify that RPM or RTM services may be furnished to patients within the global surgery period. Really, they kind of started their whole discussion that they were providing a lot of clarification on questions that they have received over the years related to these particular services. So related to patients that are on uh, RPM or RTM prior to incurring or having a surgical procedure, those ser services may continue as long as the RPM or RTM is unrelated to the diagnosis for the surgery and then the episode of care has to be distinct from that surgical episode. So if they are undergoing uh, a chronic care management um, type of diagnosis and the RPM is related to management of that chronic condition and then they break a, uh, break a bone and they're having that fixed, that global period would be separate from that RPM perhaps and, and as long as they're separate then those can continue to be billed. They, we did after the PHE resume uh, to RPM services being required only to established patients that could no longer be uh, dispensed immediately to new patients, though that requirement did not carry forward for uh, RTM, the therapeutic monitoring. You are, um, there is no established patient requirement right now for RTM. There are lots of questions and comments related to the use of digital therapies in remote monitoring. And so CMS is asking for, um, they put out a lot of questions related to information to help them really understand those opportunities and challenges so that they can evaluate their coverage and their payment policies um, and then as well how to impact that from a claims processing perspective. So there is, though there was not a lot of new information, there are a lot of questions that they're asking. I mentioned that they seem to be addressing a lot of recurring questions that they get. They reiterated that both the RPM and the RTM codes still require 16 days of data in a 30-day period to build those codes. They run through the list of codes in the code family, um, but they don't mention 98975, which is the RTM setup in patient education. So um, we're looking to see if they provide some additional information related to that. They do mention that they anticipate um, in the final rule pulling all of the code family, the RPM and the RTM code families, to follow these same rules, so we'll see exactly how they define that family set, if that includes both data collection and uh, some of the management codes. They reiterated that only one practitioner can bill uh, for the RTM or the RPM codes during a 30-day period. Again, they did not um, 
they did not specifically mention RPM treatment management services, CPT 99457. So we're looking for additional guidance related to that. Um, the same practitioner cannot bill RTM or RPM for the same period, but can bill other care management services. So we're thinking about chronic care management, principal care management, the behavioral health interventions. Um, all of those services can be billed, um, but you know it's unanswered as to whether or not one practitioner can bill for RPM and another can bill for RTM. And then um, they did reiterate that multiple devices could be dispensed to one patient, um, but only one, uh, they can only be billed once per patient per 30 day period, even if there are multiple devices. So while they intended to answer a lot of questions, they still left a lot open and actually may have created a few extra along the way um, in that clarity. Looking at the Medicare diabetes program, um, the MDDP began uh, in 2018 with an initial enrollment um, to suppliers who had achieved the CDC's diabetes prevention recognition. And the program applied uh, included no fewer than 22 intensive sessions that were furnished over 12 months by a trained coach using a specific curriculum to, you know, the real goal is to move the needle on diabetes type 2. What they found is, um, and really what their goal is in making these changes, is to make the program more marketable, both to suppliers on the provider side and to beneficiaries. There were over, uh, they noted that there are currently over 300 suppliers who represent over a thousand locations, yet only, they have only received claims from a third of those. So while there were a lot of people who jumped in and, and became certified, there are not a lot of people that are, are really um, following the program and they found for those that were that there were some significant shifts in patient health and patient quality of care. So they really are looking for efforts or trying to make efforts to make it more accessible and easier to provide uh, to the patient so that we can really see the benefit from, from this population. To do that, you'll see that they are proposing to replace certain attendance requirements that were attendance in person requirements. They, they were paying for certain sessions over certain months. It was pretty complicated how they had it structured and really seeking to sim, uh, make that more simple with fee-for-service payments for up to 22 sessions. They extended the PHE flexibilities through the end of 2027, but only for those suppliers that had made, uh, had received and maintained that recognition through the CDC. So um, they are in proposing some alternatives to the in-weight, uh, in-person weight measurement requirement, and they are uh, proposing to make, you know, allow all of these programs to, to be virtual. Um, they have to be synchronous, they can't be asynchronous, but they were really finding through the public health emergency in particular, that adoption actually um, stayed steady or improved and through these, and, and they think um, a lot of that was related to the flexibility to either do it completely remotely or at least do it hybrid so that um, the patient had flexibility in order to be all in and, and really commit to the program that some of the in-person requirements were, were uh, prohibiting their participation. So look into that if that's relevant into your practice and your specialty. Shifting over to the Medicare Shared Savings Programs, um, we have some changes to the quality reporting and quality performance requirements. There are expanding, we'll talk about just a second, on the beneficiary assignment windows. They are updating their benchmarking methodology specifically to um, apply the same uh, HCC risk adjustment model that was used in the performance year for all benchmark years. They're making some refinements to the advanced investment payment, the AIP program requirements, and they are seeking comments on quite a few MSSP policies in the future. Additional proposals that they are continuing, um, these are intended to, again, increase participation in the MSSP, um, and they think that will increase by between 10 and 20 percent. So they're, they're really hoping, again, to further move the needle. Part of it is acknowledging the, really the role that nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and clinical nurse specialists are playing in primary care services. So right now there's a two-step beneficiary attribution process. They're proposing to add a third that would allow um, for recognition of the role that those types of providers play in primary care delivery. 
They are also creating Medicare CQMs, which are the quality measures, and allowing an opportunity to transition the collection type to really help ACOs build an infrastructure, skills, and knowledge so that this can become an integral part of capturing information to report um, all payer, all patient met CQM. So they're trying to align those a little bit. The data requirements from a completeness perspective, and we'll talk about MITS a little bit mo more in just a moment, but they are modifying the MSSP requirements to, to, they will match that from a data completeness perspective. And they are also proposing to allow ACOs um, to access a list of all beneficiaries who are eligible for those Medicare CQMs. Um, this is upon request for the I data. On the line. Excuse me, Siri popped in. Uh, they are proposing um, this is available for request and um, would allow ACOs to really get some population-based activity information so that they can improve the health or reduce the growth in cost. So if that's applicable in your environment, that would be something that someone would need to have on their radar. They're allowing that to be requested and provided once a year. Um, so overtly, they won't send it to you. Someone would have to have that on their on their list to do. Digging in a little bit to the quality payment program uh, in the MIPS piece, there are some additional updates proposed for this year um, and, and in years going forward. So you might recall in the 2023 uh, Medicare Physician Fee Schedule that they did finalize data, data completeness for 2024 and 2025 performance years at 75%, meaning that providers have to report report measures on 75% of all of their patient population, not just their Medicare population. They are proposing to hold that steady at 75% in 2026 and increase it to 80% in 2027. So they have continued to ratchet that up um, incrementally, not huge, huge gaps, um, but it, it is material in the big picture as far as getting over those particular thresholds from a scoring perspective. On the quality side, they are looking to add 14 measures, including one composite and seven high priority measures. Four of those seven are reported by patients, so patient reported outcome measures. They are making substantive changes to 59 existing measures, and they were, are removing 12 quality measures from the inventory. They're also partially removing three measures, 112, 113, and 128 which are um, common measures that a lot of folks use because they're easy to aggregate the information, they're easy to report. By partial removal, they're taking them off uh, for registry reporting and QCDR reporting. They are leaving them in for uh, MIPS value pathways. So when we look at MVPs, the MIPS value pathways, they'll be eligible for those, but for the, those that are not yet adopting MVPs, those will come off the eligible list in 2024. They are also, for the folks that are using the CAPS for MIPS survey, um, it was previously suggested that you use a survey that is um, native to your patient population and their preferred language. The proposal right now would require the use of a Spanish translation for patients that prefer Spanish and then suggesting it for other uh, languages and dialects. Uh, so right now we'd be shifting from a, a recommendation to a requirement on, on Spanish translation. From a cost perspective, we're getting in these and increased questions related to costs. Clients are starting to feel that a little bit in their adjustments. They're controlling their quality. They're controlling their um, other uh, components of the MIPS participation, having a, a little more challenges with cost. Right now, the existing policy is one uh, that they would cap the cost improvement score at one percentage out of 100 points, starting with 2022 performance period. That was in the 2023, think about it as a retro adjustment. Now they are proposing to make 2022 adjustments zero and then apply this one percentage cap into the 2023, the current performance period. And then they will do that going forward. So if you think about this as technically 2024 proposed rules, they are in effect proposing changes that would impact your payment year because the performance year for 2022 is obviously behind us it would impact your payments in 2024, and it would impact your um, execution, if you will, in the current 2023 performance period. So you have to kind of watch the years as you look at those particular categories. 
For the uh, additional changes they under cost, there are currently 25 cost measures included, um, you know, the, the global measures of total per cost capita, per, yes, uh, TPCC measure and the Medicare spend per beneficiary, and then there are 23 episode cost measures. They are proposing five new measures with a 20 case minimum. Those are two, uh, two related to, um, excuse me, one that is acute inpatient related to psychosis and related conditions. There are three chronic condition measures, depression, heart failure, and low back pain. And then there's a measure that's focusing on the emergency department setting. They're also proposing to remove pneumonia, uh, simple pneumonia with hospitalization. If you've not followed along in some of these, uh, these measures all go through a testing period. It used to be 12 months. They have extended it to 18 months, but they do do field testing. Um, so, for example, we've had clients that um, received information. They received scores, if you will, on how they performed in the 2019 calendar year um, as, a, as a patient care time period. They got that report in 2022. There was a field test where they collected additional claims information in 2022, all related to low back pain. And here we're seeing it as a proposed adoption of that measure in 2024. I share that to say, you know, it's not as overt as it is in this Medicare physician fee schedule where there are comments and, and your ability to weigh in and influence. But the, on these field testing um, considerations, you can see here, I just pulled what was on the field test for 2023 related to CKD, ESRD, kidney transplant, a lot on the kidney side. Um, but you see the number of work groups and the number of specialties. So your specialty society is hopefully weighing in on these. But if um, you know, something to keep our eye on and for you to weigh in. If you get one of those field test reports to really dig into it, see what it, how it applies to you, how it could impact you, and then provide comments there as well. Not a lot of change in improvement activities, just a little bit of shifting among the buckets. They're adding some, they're removing some. There will still be about 108 plenty to choose from as you're going through, but you do, as with each year, need to review what you have done in the past, look at it going forward to make sure that there were no substantive changes there. This is a big one, looking at the promoting interoperability. Last year, we had proposals that they might delete all of the categories on the left, including, uh, at that time, the clinical social workers, at the final rule, they determined to um, to continue automatic reweighting. Right now, they're proposing on the left to discontinue for PT, OT, speech language pathology, audiology, psychologist, and dietary services, and then continue on for clinical social workers. They will also continue that automatic reweighting for ASCs, hospital-based patients, non-patient facing, and then those small practices. So what does that mean? Does it mean you don't get that reweighting? It does not. If this goes through, it means that the, the provider types on the left will need to go out and request that reweighting. So it doesn't mean it, it, it automatically kicks in because a lot of times these providers on the left don't have the opportunity to influence their participation in the EMR selection and utilization. So in those situations, you would just have to go out and file that consideration and have that reweighted. They are um, proposing the performance period for PI to increase from, um, from a current 90-day period up to 180 days. That purpose is to align with hospital and critical access requirements. The PDMP, the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, they're just changing the definition. They were finding some confusion in the prescriber definition, so they are modifying that, and then they are shifting to require a yes answer before they accepted a yes or no. You just had to answer on the safer guides measures. They are increasing or proposing to increase that performance threshold from 75 to 82. And it's interesting because they, with that increase, they are expecting, you refer to my notes, um, that really only uh, that about a third of the providers will no longer pass if we move up to that 82. And they're still, remember, there's the budget neutrality requirements, so they can't pay bonuses unless they have penalties. They feel like everybody's coming out of the PHE, so they don't expect a lot of exclusions in 2024 related to, um, I'll just say, COVID hangover. Um, so they feel like there will be more participation. There will be more people who don't pass, which will create penalties, which will create upside for those who do and do well. There are some other impacts for IT vendors that will be important as we move forward and then some changes to the public reporting 
processes and procedures, and then as well as the targeted reviews. So as soon as you get your information, and they were hoping to have it early August um, for for the reports to come out to if you need a targeted review, if you feel like there's information that's incorrect on your reports, the windows are shifting. And they're doing that because they have to have the provider list and participation hammered out by October 1st so we can plan for um, you know, who all's bundled into the current requirement to report. Finally, on an MPP, before I turn it back over to Angie, they did add uh, our proposing five new value pathways. You see those listed here. Um, and we mentioned the partially reviewed measures that are continuing to work towards 2027, um, you know, as a, as a more robust adoption of these. They're adding them at a rate of about three to five each year. So they still have a long way to go, I think, as we're working with providers to find a, a category that they fit naturally into. So currently I, I'm seeing low to moderate adoption, probably low adoption on the MIPS value pathways as, as people continue to evaluate what that's going to look like as we move forward. So Angie, what does that make you think about from a comp perspective? So, well, this is super fun, right? I mean, the Medicare physician fee schedule each year with its release of the proposed rule allows us an opportunity to reflect as it relates to quality payments and reimbursement at risk to the organization overall. That metric of how much reimbursement for an organization is at risk is an important one because that metric, that percentage of total reimbursement at risk for, for quality incentives across all payers um, informs the compensation design and the compensation planning for providers, or, or at least it should, because if you're thinking about overall uh, compensation to collections ratios, if you're thinking about how the, the providers are, are paid and to the extent that it makes sense to align some of the same quality and cost measures with your physician compensation, quality and cost incentives within their agreements, it makes sense. It creates an alignment, a financial alignment between how the organization is getting paid and how the physician is, is being compensated. And so when we're thinking about, you know, heaven forbid that there, there is a penalty for a particular provider as it relates to, to quality or, or cost, we need to begin, as this percentage continues to increase, we need to be thinking about not only the, the FMV of the physician's compensation, but also the commercial reasonableness side of that. So if a physician has a significant penalty for not meeting the thresholds, does it make sense? Does it make business sense to not also have some kind of um, clawback penalty or, or threshold or limitation on that physician's compensation as it relates? And I know that that idea is out there and perhaps a bit, a bit on the fringe, but again, as that percentage of reimbursement at risk continues to increase, these are the things that people in and work in provider compensation planning need to be really thinking through. Also, we know that the reimbursement change is on a two-year lag. So we have the performance that doesn't align with the, with the collections. So while it gives us time, right? <laughs> it gives us time to think through and, and consider that from, from a timing perspective. Um, there is, there is a, a bit of a mismatch that organizations have to think through and, and how they're going to consider that within, again, within the physician design, compensation design, and within the, the physician construct. So now is really a good time, as it is with every year with the proposed rule coming out, to ensure that the alignment of incentives, the at-risk reimbursement and the incentives with physicians, um, to the extent and where possible, they're, they're aligned. Um, if you're measuring things for your payers, including Medicare as it relates to, to clinical quality, if you're measuring those things already, 
um, it from an administrative standpoint, it creates a simplicity then to also be measuring those things within the incentive construct within a physician compensation design. So just a few things to, to think through um, as it relates to this. And I know that um, we've come to the end of our time together in the slide deck that you will find um, online for our participants. We have several resources available to you, including a link to the proposed rule, as well as the CMS fact sheet, um, and another uh, as it relates to QPP or resources page as well. So I think our, just remember, the comments are due September 11th, 2023 by 5 p.m., so please get get those in. Um, I know that both Lori and Valerie provided comments as to, you know, we really need to be commenting on this so that that Medicare does understand um, the complexity and where where you sit as it relates to these rules. It's, it's very important um, to get to get these comments in. In just a moment, I'm going to turn things over to, to Shannon to close us out. But at the top of, of our discussion today, we promised a deep dive. I thank Lori and Valerie um, for, for helping us today accomplish that goal, because I do think we, we did. We, we dove deep uh, into several of the topics as it relates to the proposed rule. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn things over to Shannon to close us out officially for today. Thank you for listening to this PYA webinar recast. The video recording, slides, and associated material for this and all PYA webinars are available on our website. If you have any questions or if we can help, please contact us at pyapc.com. Thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Hey!